Good afternoon. Um, we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Jane Dummer, and thank you so much for joining us for this conference, Globalization versus Deglobalization within the food industry. Um, my background is the uh, health expert here at CL, and I've been the health expert for five years. And I run a business that consults in food, health, nutrition, and agriculture uh, with clients across Canada and the US um, in the area of business development, advisory, research, and communications. And with me today, I have uh, Dr. Sol Solvain Charlebois, uh, Jenny Longo, and Danielle Lacoste. And I'll let them introduce themselves because I don't want to miss anything exciting about their introduction. So I'll start with Salvin. Sure. I was born in... <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, my name is Sylvain Chalabois, director of the Agri-Food Analytics Lab at Dalhousie University uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I'm currently a visiting scholar at the University of South Florida in Tampa Bay, which explains the tan and uh, the cold. I'm so cold right now. Jeez. Um, I'm also co-host of the Food Professor podcast, which is actually the official podcast of to this year's Seattle in Montreal. We're at booth 301, if you want to come and have a chat uh, in our studio. We're having a lot of fun. We're meeting a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, meeting different companies, introducing new products. It's been great so far. So, yeah, looking forward to talk about uh, local versus global. Thank you for being here. And next, Jenny. Thank you for having Is this working? Is it? I can hear you. Actually. Okay. So I'm <laughs> Jenny Longo from Longo's. Um, it oh, is on. Yeah, it is on. It is on. So, well, that's better. So I'm Senior Director of Private Brands, um, Culinary Innovation, and Central Kitchen at Longo's. Uh, we're in, based in Ontario, so that's why I'm so pale. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we have 36 locations in an online e commerce business called Grocery Gateway. Uh, we're a family owned and operated for 65 years till recently. Um, uh, last year, we um, partnered with Empire Group on a uh, partnership. So that's about me. Hi, uh, Daniel Lacoste. I'm the local guy in the story over here. So uh, <laughs> I work for uh, Boulangerie Saint Method uh, as the vice president of sales, marketing, and distribution. Uh, Boulangerie Saint Method, if you don't know them, it's a uh, uh, family-owned business, uh, uh, been in Quebec for 75 years. We're the second largest um, sliced bread company uh, in Quebec, and by the same circumstance, we're the third largest in Canada, even though we only sell in Quebec. Great, thank you. Um, honored to have these expert panelists here. So, Sylvain is representing um, an academic insight, Jenny's the retail insight, and then Danielle is the manufacturing insight. And so, I'll just give you a brief um, overview of globalization versus deglobalization. And then I'm going to pose questions to each of the panelists. And then I'll ask the audience if you have any questions. I've got my, uh, my timer going, so um, we'll make sure that we get some questions in. And then we'll do a final question to the panelists, and then I'll wrap up. Um, so globalization is really looking at international trade, allowing for um, international influence. Prior to air cargo, we relied on ships and rail. Um, but once we got air cargo, we had faster and greater extent uh, for international trade. Um, it, the access is basically to products from around the world. It increases competition. And ideally, it should decrease price uh, point because of the increase in competition. Where deglobalization is, is the lack of international trade, focusing on more of a protectionism within the nation and focusing and, and looking at solutions locally and nationally um, to be self-sufficient. So those, again, just an overview if you, uh, if you needed that. And then my first question is going to go to Sylvain. And so given the recent uh, histor historical events, including the global pandemic, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. When it comes to the North American food industry, what are your top three recommendations for the balance between global and local? And, yeah. and stick to three. We've only got yeah. 40 minutes left. Sure. <laughs> uh, 
Lots going on around the world. Uh, there's lots of questioning going on around the world. Uh, and when you go on the floor, you when you talk about trades, a lot of people are asking, well, what's going on? Are we better off doing our own stuff? I've I was never a believer of that. I think a mix of different things, especially in Canada, we have so much to offer to the rest of the world. Uh, we're trade focused. I mean, basically, um, here in Quebec, uh, there's a mixture of a lot of great things going on. We f we think local, uh, but we also export a lot. Uh, in Ontario, very focused on processing and exports. Prairies, they don't even think about local, really. BC is similar to Quebec. So there's lots of great stuff going on in Canada. And uh, I was just talking over lunch with uh, Jean Gautuzeau, the, the former CEO of La Somme. He's very focused on trades. And I mean, that's the bottom line, when you look at the grand scheme of things, it, the, it, there's US, China, and everyone else. Okay, that's where I start. Okay, and start. we're part of the everyone else. And that's the game that's going on. And of course, it's being challenged by the invasion and everything else. And it's going to last for a while. So the, the world will be destabilized for a while, and it'll be more questioning. But I do believe that trades are going to be part of the solution, as well as honoring consumers who actually want local. I, I think a mixture of both is a good thing, because you can in innovate on both fronts. And so when we're looking at local, and you mentioned we're doing some really interesting things, but there are products and goods just the way w we're set in the world that we can't grow commercially, we can't provide commercially. Um, do you think the consumer understands that? Um, do you think the consumer that's really pushing for deglobalization and a local um, understands what that actually means? Uh, more than two years ago, but okay. not enough. Uh, I have to say that I've never talked about supply chain management as, as much as in the last two years, which is refreshing, you know? A lot of people wanted a transparent supply chain without knowing what it meant before COVID. Yeah. Now they know what it means. Yes. Empty shells and, you know, and of course with Ukraine, I mean, the worst is yet to come. The famine and everything else. Right. And, and Germany, Price is going to rise by anywhere between 20 to 50 percent. That's not Ethiopia. That's mm -hmm. Germany. Right. So, I'm concerned absolutely about the future and supply chains are disrupted and frankly broken. Mm -hmm. But we're going to get there. Right. And so, and so, in the question, uh, any solution right now for globalization? So, like you say, things are broken from the pandemic. Things are broken from the war. Things were broken prior to those two events. <laughs> well, I don't want to steal the show here, but I actually do think that the JIT model is is under siege. I think it's being questioned. I would question. I I was a big believer of JIT uh, myself. I actually thought that the food industry got had it right, but what we've learned the last two years is that the just in time model just is limiting. Right, and so, so and the auto industry is under. Doing that but right. I, I do think that there's going to be a shift from JIT to uh, just in case a lot more. Okay. So inventory building, supporting local and supporting trades as well as we're trying to figure out what, what is going on. Okay. So that was the question to Solven and um, Jenny or Danielle, do you have anything to add to looking at solutions both locally? Um, so. And, and globally, so de-globalization and, and, and um, globalization. So just based on what Sylvain said, is there any additions that you have before we go on? I, I would just add to that that, um, th you know, as a retailer, the consumer's always been fortunate to have products from everywhere. I think that the, um, the risk with the, you know, the supply chain and, and the pressures, it's giving a lot of opportunity for local. So and also uh, educating the customer on more of the local offering and uh, helping our own economy more. So I think it's an opportunity as well. That's good to, to note the opportunity. And consumer cost, is there anything associated where, where they're complaining or being verbal? Or I know a product, you know, we were, I was at, with Danielle yesterday at a, a retail store and I was talking about a product that, 
you know, kind of at the 4.99 level, it's gone up a dollar, right? So now it's now it's 5.99. So you're really noticing that, like, it's not just going up 10 cents. Um, so yeah, the <laughs> grocery price pressure. I mean, that's all you hear. I mean, the, the media does a good job covering it as well. It's always the uh, grocery sector that you know everything's gone up. Yeah. Bad, bad, bad. Yeah, <laughs> like if you look at gas today. Everyone, we were talking earlier about yeah, the no. price of gas and everything, yeah. but it just seems that you know grocery is more scrutinized. And we're going to continue to see increases, and it's, it's going to be a new reality, I think. Right. Thanks. Daniel? From a manufacturing side of the business, uh, before being in the bread business, I was in the pickle business. And the challenge that we had was to have the availability of raw material all, all through the year, right? But I think one of our resources, especially in Quebec, it's electricity. So how can we can build greenhouses and produce even more vegetables or more fruit? Uh, Looking at Iceland, they're a strong producer of bananas, but they're in the middle of nowhere. They're using the heat of the volcano uh, to, to produce bananas. So how can we, ch to be more self-sufficient in Canada? Uh, we live in a cold country, so we don't, grow, we don't have three crops of product per year. We have only one. And if Mother Nature is on our side, we've got a good one. If Mother Nature is not on our side, like last year, it's, it's terrible, right? So um, we'll have to be uh, creative on our way to... Um, to grow uh, the, 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 our basic stuff or, or to go back like our grandparents do, the more pickling or more, you know, try to eat what's available like apples or more potatoes, which uh, going back to yeah, the old, no. old school way of eating. But now we're used to eat everything, right? So we, we know people have been traveling, they eat everything, they, 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 everything's available. Uh, 50, 50 years ago, you, you had no oranges, no... You know, you, you were eating what's, what's available. You got an orange for Christmas 15 exactly. years ago, right? Exactly. And, so and it was a big I, 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 I'm, I'm not wishing to go back there, but we need to find solutions to grow more no, and harvest more. It's a good good example of giving solutions what other countries are doing, so adopting um, that because, again, we don't have the heat units, we don't have the climate to grow year-round. Um, and then when we do have a really bad drought or something that is impeding that one crop, it's it's a bit of a problem. So what are the solutions, and you know what can we do creatively? That's great. So moving on to the retail question to Jenny. Um, so Jenny, the food supply chain has been impacted again by these events, including Brexit as well, um, the pandemic, the war. As a retailer, can you give us some other examples, um, one or two examples of how the global alterations have shifted your business, and what? Um, has been implemented or changed to meet the needs of your consumers um, while addressing, and you, we talked a little bit about costs, but if you have any more more insight about the costs, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, the, the pressures on the supply chain obviously have been unprecedented as they are now, but the opportunities are for, for us at Longo's, I mean, um, Sylvain touched on it a little bit, you know, a future buying versus we're actually forced to future buy a bit better than pre previous, than the just-in-time concept. Um, we, we at Longos are promoting more of our own brand, so private label has a big opportunity. I'm plugging my position here. <laughs> but it's because we can control our own destiny with our own products because we can actually you know, forecast a little bit better, and you're not at the mercy of the um, supply chain because we're smaller, so maybe we're not um, we're compromised to be f uh, filled because of some of the bigger players in the market. So um, kind of um, changing uh, the course of our own destiny by having our own brands and, and promoting those more so we have the product. I think, and local, I mean, we can't ignore the local. I think there is a need to support more local and um, kind of similar to what Daniel said about the sustaining our own um, growth and um, our own um, supply chain through local products. You know, that's a really good example about the private label. and. If anybody's been following the news with Sunwing and their third party uh, reservation. <laughs> um, and, and so when you're at the mercy of um, supplier. I'm here, but because I didn't fly Sunwing. Okay, yeah. And so, so that's an example that their reservation um, was hacked um, and it was a third party in control of that. So they weren't actually in control of, of that piece of their business, um, which. It'll be really, the fallout for that's going to be incredible. But so getting back to Jenny's point about the private label, so bringing in um, that control within your company, um, I think is a really, like Jenny said, it's a great opportunity um, that you can, you can have that control, you can have that 
um, sup that, that supply information at your fingertips and you're not relying on a third party. Um, and because that's your background, <laughs> that's your department, I think that's fantastic. And, and Longo's in Ontario is a really well-recognized premium brand. Um, so, you know, I think your customers would be really happy with that solution. At least I, I would be happy with that solution. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, there's also that trust factor. So you were talking about the song wing and you said you didn't fly it because, you know, you think of who you trust. And so luckily we do have that following and that trust factor. And I think with everything that's happened, those brands are more important to have that trust factor. So we saw our sales increase during COVID because people felt comfortable and trusted shopping with us uh, from a safety. Now with COVID kind of declining, they're going back to the discounters. So trust also plays a key role in a lot of um, consumer uh, decisions. So especially during those travel times. So. Yes, with when, when there's uncertain times, we go to stuff that makes us feel comfortable. We go to stuff that is almost nostalgic. Um, and, and so that's a really important piece to think about as companies um, that, you know, if you're getting um, consumer feedback to make sure that you are building that trust and that brand awareness. Um, so, you know, those are excellent points. Um, so, Danielle, do you have anything to add on the retail side? Because I know I'm going to ask you your question on the manufacturing side, but I just don't want to cut you off. You've got any insights. Okay. All right. So the next question um, goes to Danielle. And Danielle, and he is, again, in the, on the manufacturing side, specifically here in Quebec. And so describe how your company attaches significant importance to the use of raw local materials and how has that allowed it to function during the past few years of global uncertainty? The, the, the thing with uh, same method, I think we've been on trend 75 years ago until today. It's, it's, it's part of our DNA and our responsibility since the beginning of the company to um, uh, buy as much as possible local product. And it's, it's not only for the, the raw material that we use in our bread, but it's also for uh, any given support we need or supplier that we need. We're always going to look for a local solution. It's part of to to give back to the uh, the economy of Quebec. It's part of our DNA. Um, but thinking, even though if we source uh, most of a large part or most of our source of our of our flour and our oat in Quebec, we develop that with a specific company to make sure we've got the right product and to to you know produce the best bread for the and give the best taste profile for for the Quebecers over here. Um, what's going on right now with uh, Ukraine and Russia? Uh, is going to put pressure on price big time. So even if we source locally, <laughs> our, our, the growers over here are going to have a big opportunity to sell their, their stock to whoever has the uh, uh, deepest pocket. Uh, so the, the price will like go to the roof. Um, it, it's been a tough situation last year, but it's even worse than right now. So uh, even if you're local. But, uh, but I got to tell you, Daniel, I live in Halifax. I would love to be able to buy your product. Just, you know, put that on the table, which means, I mean, at some point, I mean, you were asking about solutions. I, I, think, I think one thing that Quebec has it, has it right is, is, uh, is its food autonomy policy. Um, I wish all provinces would have a food autonomy policy. Can you explain that a little bit more? I for will. For people who do not know. I'm that. getting there. Okay. Uh, essentially, this is the way I define food autonomy. So there's food sovereignty, grow to feed your own, you know, in a closed economy. I've always believed that it's important to grow for your population, but at the same time, it's important to offer food affordability to your population as well. And Quebec only has 9 million people, so how do you achieve that? I mean, you can't, you have to build economies of scale in order, and you bring down your unit costs in order to supply affordable food to your population. The food autonomy policy in Quebec, I think, is brilliant because it thinks about food sovereignty in an open economy concept. So, one example uh, that we've seen uh, of late, thinking about local and global. Uh, is the story related to strawberries in Quebec. You can buy locally grown strawberries in Quebec all year round now. Brilliant. So two things are happening. One, you're building an economy to eventually perhaps export the know-how around strawberries. And I picked strawberries when I was a kid here. Uh, to the rest of the world. Not year round. 
Uh, well, why not? No, you didn't as a kid. No, no, no. As a kid, you didn't pick strawberries. Quebecers, <laughs> when I was a kid, Quebecers were just hardwired to think about local strawberries mid-June to first week of July. That's it. And then after that, it's tasteless California strawberries. That's that's how we, we were hardwired to think that way. Not anymore because we're growing our own strawberries all year round because there's more production and we're hardwiring consumers to think local about strawberries all year round, which is really the biggest paradigm barrier we all have. So we often say, well, local is great, but it's expensive. Uh, it's not accessible. Well, let's deal with that. Let's make it accessible and affordable. And the food autonomy policy in Quebec does that. That's a good example. And again, thank you, because you're educating me uh, on that as well. Um, but yeah, no, that's a good point. And if there's possibility that we could... Was going back to Danielle, I mean, yes, my, my comment about I would love to buy his product in Halifax, that's kind of what I'm trying to say here. Yes. Same method has... I mean, it's so much potential, I think, outside of Quebec. The bread we eat in Florida is crap. It's just not good. You don't like Wonder Bread? Because, I, <laughs> <laughs> because I've tasted same method products, and they're great. So how much I owe you now? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Danielle, is there anything else you want to add versus... You, you were mentioning about the price going up. So are you concerned about your local supplier exporting more now because there is a need there's a need globally and so you know you will now have to uh, pay the consequences of that opportunity of them exporting yeah totally and uh, we're, we were talking to someone from uh, manitoba downstairs and they were not never in the past they thought they were thinking about exporting their their production right and now they're thinking about it because there is like a 40 percent shortages uh, on the planet, that will happen soon. And if they if they don't plant any seed right now, we're, it's gonna. And the other factor is Mother Nature as well. Uh, don't forget, last year in Canada, we had a very bad crop on, on weed. Uh, the prairies there were like burning. So that's droughts in the U.S., drought in Russia, floods in Germany. So all this, we we need to think how we grow stuff differently that we used to. And I think that's gonna be the biggest challenge. And coming back to to, to Sylvain's point on strawberry, strawberry or raspberry, whatever, it, it doesn't make sense to have truckloads coming back and forth from California to Canada, Ontario, or Quebec every week and burning gas like crazy, right? With, with so. the water situation in California, if we do it right in 20 years from now, we're not going to be buying $4 billion worth of produce from California. We're going to be selling $4 billion mm -hmm. worth of produce mm -hmm. to California. Right. That's the... The resources we have in Canada are, are incredible. We have a lot to offer. And so we need to get our act together. Is that what you're saying? Well, I think <laughs> Quebec has. Okay. We so need Quebec Ontario has. and everyone so, else. So, and I really feel at this point we're in a, a crisis. And so we need to share the information and how things are being done. You know, just like... A, I started my career doing food safety in the late 90s, and we were having food safety problems all over North America. And competing companies worked together and said, okay, let's, get, let's stop killing people, and let's you know, get processes in place, and let's do this. And I really feel at this point that we need to work collaboratively um, for the Canadian economy, right? So it's, it's, it's time to act, and it's time to move. So how do we build resilience? I mean, some some of the, <laughs> I mean, so, yeah, I th I think the it w it's all laid out now. I mean, uh, we've we're good at creating committees and task force in Canada for we're sure. Doing environmental scans. Yes. 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 We so don't need another environmental scan. Yes. So, um, but I but I but I do think that uh, we need you know, we need more authoritative work being done in Canada with. Uh, of course, there's the political cycle that really comes uh, in the way, but I actually do think that uh, at some point we're going to have to really settle on some important issues like logistics and transportation. To me, that's a super key, important one. And the other issue, of course, is has, has a lot to do with um, 
food affordability and it goes back to a lot of the things you just said uh, in terms in terms of what we're eating where it's coming from uh, but like I said I mean Canada it's hard for us to, to admit like with what's going on in the conflict we're, we're somewhat responsible for the cost of fertilizers in Canada we're responsible for seeing prices going up around the world because we're not doing our job we're not influential enough I mean, I've been in the U.S. for five months. I barely hear about Canada. I've never he heard hear about Canada. We we don't we don't matter. No, they we should people, matter people, when it comes to food. People ask, "What do they think about us?" They don't think about us. They don't think about us. That's the problem. They need to start thinking about us. Anyways, sorry. Any any two bit resilient comment as we're as we're winding down a bit? Jenny, you want to go or Jenny? Any? No, I think the uh, workforce is another whole area we could speak about for hours. So I do yes. think it needs to be addressed, but I don't know what the solution is, and I wish I did. We need to look at our own company and facility to make the best out of it, right? This, this we're, we're trying to do more with less. Mm -hmm. this, this is what we do every day, right? Because workforce not there. <laughs> we, we have, uh, we're DSD, so we have 90 four routes across Quebec. We need people to wake up early in the morning to Can deliver. Can you clarify DSD for uh, anybody who doesn't the, the, know? The direct store delivering. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and we have, we need those people to go at store level to place the bread. And it's to always work on solution, be more effective, uh, mm -hmm. try to cut down on the waste. It's, it's, it's a never ending story, but it's, I think we're all responsible to what each one have our part to play in that, right? Mm -hmm. And and the labor issue is is huge since the past three years. Like I mean, it was a, an issue prior to the pandemic, and now it's just been expedited, and and that's a huge challenge. And it's it's disappointing. Like I, I I'm just super disappointed with it, but I don't want to. <laughs> again, that's a, a personal thing. Um, but yeah, no, that's again. Thank you for your comments and your question. I, we can take one more question before we have a final question. Yes, gentlemen there. Do you think the immigration? Would be part of the solution increasing the immigration? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I suppose from your question, you're asking to su to support the ag industry, in the, generally speaking, or just the economy overall. Uh, more specifically, the ag economy. Yeah, absolutely. With more immigration, you solve two problems. One, you need. You need the workforce you need. You increase the workforce you need. And two, you, you get more inspiration for innovation. Like, but think of food service. I mean, we have all access to a lot of cuisines in Canada as a result of immigration. I mean, the, the wonderful things that immigrants have come with to Canada, it, the idea is just amazing. I mean, with more diversity, you get more innovation. With more immigrants, you get more innovation. Any other comments regarding the immigration to for too, that solution? It's too long, you know, too short. To short the, the time between you, you're asking for people to come, and that that by the time they come, it's like a year after, right? It, it's tough to get people. Uh, it's and they want to come. We want to, and we, uh, as manufacturer, we. I know there's. Uh, we're doing a great job, right? We're we're trying to um, helping. They're, they're look. It's tough for those people. Uh, we had like um, 10 people who came uh, two weeks ago. They come over here, it's cold like hell. They are not used to that. They're they are away from their family. They, they, they speak the language, but because we try to have French speaking people to come over here, but it, it's tough. For, so we need to do a, a good job to make them at home and to facilitate as much as possible their integration and to bring their family as well. Not only the workers, but uh, most of the People coming, they, they have spouses, they've got children, so we need to bring them. We home. can do better with the assimilation. Oh, for sure. And universities are part of the blame. Facility. Say that again. F universities are part. I'm an academic. I think we should uh, partly blame universities. We cash in with the, with uh, international students. We make a lot of money. We don't keep them. They come here, they they take courses, they get a degree, and then they go back home. That's a problem. We see it at Dow, I see it at McGill, I see it everywhere. And we make a lot of money. It's double tuition. We need to work on that. Yeah, no, lots of, lots of pieces within that immigration 
uh, component. So thank you for raising that, and and I I agree with it. it's part of the solution, but we need better strategy around that solution. So I just want to pose one last question to our uh, panelists, and then we'll we'll wrap up for the day. So provide one step or solution at a policy level and one step or solution at an industry level that would modernize our food uh, supply, making it less fragile, as we've been talking about, <laughs> to global disruptions and crisis. So if you've already said it, like the three of you, if you've already said it, just re recap, um, that would be great. So just, again, one step at a policy level, so maybe, again, around immigration or Sylvain about the Quebec um, policy you were talking about, and then one solution at the industry level. Yeah, I mean, it was mentioned that we have a food policy council in Canada. I'm just not sure what it's doing. Uh, it's it can be it can mean a lot of things to different people. I would focus on food autonomy nationally. Food autonomy. Yeah, food nationally. autonomy and the task force. I would certainly uh, give a lot of attention to the task force. Uh, and Jenny will like my next comment: the code of conduct. <laughs> we need a code of conduct to set peace in the food industry. A lot of people may not know this in the audience, but there's a lot of tension in the food industry right now. The stop sell between Frito-Lay and Loblaws was not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's, it's symptomatic to a much broader problem. And so if we're thinking about food access, food autonomy, if we're talking about local, that's a huge problem. We need to, we need to resolve this. And so we need a code of conduct to make sure that grocers work and with who'd be processors. And responsible for policing that code of conduct? Well, that's the debate right now. I mean, who's going to do it? And so there, I don't know, do you want to speak to that? Uh, how you no, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Yeah. I think, though, that it, it, the loss is that no one wants to take the accountability to say who's going to govern it. But um, it's definitely needed. Yes. Yeah. No, those are good points. Jenny, any? any uh, I would agree with what Elaine said, but I'd also add on that um, more so about um, the sustainability and how we grow product and how we govern what's in products and, and what we declare and don't declare in, in product ingredients and, and getting more healthier foods locally mm -hmm. into people's mouths. Okay, so uh, the sustainability piece, so that's an interesting point. Yeah, great, thanks. And Danielle? Uh, for me, it's sustainability is part of the question. It's probably in the future we're, we, we'll have to ask ourselves what we eat, right? Because they're Eating a burger is very good, right? And I'm not vegetarian, by the way. I love a big burger. But uh, if we want to have to give our, our kids a, a proper hurt and leave, leave, you know, a better a future for our kids, we'll probably have to change the way we eat and how we eat and how we grow our stuff to make it more sustainable and more environment. I'm sorry, my English is bad. But, you know, to make it... Uh, so, so we take decision not only on dollar, but to, to make decision on what's good for for the future generation to come. Yeah, and then it's the acceptance around those food products. So as the gentleman said here, we're, we're used to having so m much convenience and so many products available, um, but that comes at a cost, um, not only financially. So when we're looking at how to make our local crops more sustainable and more nutritious, I mean, I want it. It's my background. I wanted to be doing that 20 years ago. And, then, and again, things aren't, you know, it's always, again, this reactive, more of that resilient piece. Um, and, and again, when we're looking at agriculture, we can't just find a new supplier. Like, it's, it's a crop rotation. It's dealing with environmental concerns. And, and, and so um, consumers, I think, are becoming way more aware of that because of the pandemic, and especially when they're looking at Ukraine and you know, sunflower oil coming out of Ukraine and Russia that supplies 60% of the world with sunflower oil. We were growing sunflowers in Manitoba and a more mm, um, profitable crop came by, <laughs> soybean. That's what farmers do. Right? And uh, no more, no more sunflowers here in Canada. So. You know, do we are we looking at that right now? I don't know. I don't. I mean, I don't know what's happening with the sunflower issue, but sunflower lecithin and sunflower oil. This is like when you say the worst is yet to come. Like that's this is a big situation um, just on that one crop alone. 
So there's a lot to think about, and I want to thank our panelists for their expert insights. So Sylvain, Jenny, and Danielle, um, your insights have been excellent, both at, again, a global level and a local level. And there's a lot to think about. There's a lot that can be done strategically at a national level. Um, so, you know, not just activities, but strategies and measured outcomes, um, right? Measured outcomes. <laughs> um, not just, again, that we're doing activities and that activities, what is that leading to? How is that making Canada more resilient? How is that putting Canada on a stage for exporting? Um, so, so much to think about. I want to thank you uh, for, for joining us today and, again, listening to the excellent insights of our panelists. And, again, my name is Jane Dummer. I'm the health expert. I'll be here um, over the next day and a half and around the expert hub. I have a presentation tomorrow at 9.45 as well about plant-based. Um, so I'll be talking about the, the opportunities there and how, you know, there are opportunities within within Canada, especially within our crops. So again, thank you for attending our globalization versus deglobalization, and I wish you a great show. Thank you.